Ladies and gentlemen, the lecture will start in three minutes. Please take your seat and turn off your cell phone. Thank you for your cooperation. Now let's welcome Dr. Peter Raven and today's uh, moderator, <laughs> Vice President Jian Ren Chen. Uh, Dr. Peter Raven, um, Mrs. Raven, uh, can you see her? <laughs> okay, and uh, oh, pr oh yes, uh, Mrs. Raven's here, and uh, our uh, emeritus and uh, president uh, YTD and academicians, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is really our, our honor and pleasure uh, to have. Uh, our new honorary uh, academician, uh, Peter Ravens, uh, to come to Taiwan and join us here. And we are really honored, and it's also, also our pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Raven uh, to come to our Academic Sinica. And just now, uh, President uh, Lee said that it is really our honor to have uh, uh, Dr. Raven being elected as our honorary member and I just uh, mentioned that our honorary member the number of it is less than 10 and we started this on uh, a new system uh, recently and uh, a lot of uh, uh, honorary members are Nobel laureate and also very outstanding scholars uh, internationally and so uh, today uh, we are very glad to have uh, him and also uh, Mrs. Raven to join us and also to give us uh, a lecture and before that, I would like to uh, present this uh, a kind of uh, award to uh, Dr. Uh, Raven. <laughs> Our new academician, Raven, is going to give a talk on the global sustainability and the future of Taiwan. And I would like to give a very short an, uh, introduction of uh, Dr. Raven. I believe all of you already uh, knew him very well. Uh, but um, uh, when I look at this, um, uh, the CV of uh, Dr. Raven, it is really amazing to me. And I think he's a uh, very uh, good role model for all life scientists here. And Dr. Raven uh, got his uh, bachelor degree from the UC Berkeley with the highest honor uh, at age of 21. And more amazingly, he got his uh, PhD degree from UCLA at age of 23. And uh, he work, has been working for uh, uh, several uh, institutions. And he got us and he had been elected as the members, fellows, or foreign members or fellows of 28 uh, academies of science in the whole world. And he received an uh, uh, honorary doctor degree uh, from 22 universities in the whole world, including our National Sun Yishan University in year 2001 and National Chenggong University in year 2011. So Dr. Raven has a very good relationship with uh, the Taiwan, and he knows very well about Taiwan. That's the reason why he's going to give a talk on the future of Taiwan. And uh, in addition to his uh, honorary uh, doctor degree of science, he also received a uh, Doctors of Human Letters from the uh, Webster University uh, in 1989. And if I'm going to, if I read all the honors he received, then it will take more than 10 minutes. And it's uh, in uh, three whole pages. So I won't go through that. But uh, it's just, I just want to mention that um, from um, his track record, we know that uh, the Professor Peter Raven indeed is a uh, very, very outstanding uh, scholar, and also uh, it's our honor and pleasure to have him as our honorary members. So uh, with that, I would like to invite an, uh, uh, Peter to give us a talk on global sustainability and the future of Taiwan. Let's welcome uh, <laughs> Dr. Raven.
Well, it's a very special honor and pleasure for me to be welcomed in this very nice way to the uh, Academia Sinica in Taiwan. I first came here about 20 years ago, and I have been able to watch the remarkable growth and success of science in Taiwan. And I certainly will be delighted in my new role to do everything that I can to further cooperation around the world and to try to help to enhance the scientific advances in Taiwan, which are of benefit not only to Taiwan, but to the whole world. And so I want to talk about global sustainability in the future of Taiwan. And as you will see, and as I'll develop during the course of these remarks, I want both to emphasize the unique nature of the biodiversity of Taiwan and the need to attain sustainability in Taiwan on the basis of the living and non-living systems that control life here. But I want also to put that for you in a global context so that I can bring up a number of factors that I would recommend very strongly be taken more into account for the future of Taiwan. Uh, Guo Feng Chang uh, has presented a wonderful paper on Taiwan and has consistently in his teaching at NTU and generally been a great advocate and presenter of the biodiversity of this island. Like the coast of California, which is where I'm native, Taiwan reaches great heights because of being pushed against a deep ocean trench as the plates move out into the Pacific. And that gives it a variety, a geological variety that is incredible for such a small area the biodiversity of Taiwan is rich and very diverse, and the, the Endemic Species Research Institute, part of the Council of Agriculture, has done a great job of presenting that biodiversity to a public in Taiwan that is about as interested in biodiversity, I think, as any public anywhere in the world. Uh, it's very popular, and there's very strong feelings here, as you all know, of relationship with biological diversity, which are very important. <clears throat> now, in starting to talk about stresses on the world environment, human beings or, or uh, our very close relatives have inhabited the Earth for about two, two million years of its 4.54 billion year history, so we're recent newcomers, but even more recent is the advent of crop agriculture and the domestication of animals, which we now would date to about 11,200 years ago, or about <clears throat> um, 500 human generations. At the time when we first, when our ancestors first developed agriculture, the population of the entire world, which consisted of hunter-gatherers, is estimated to have been about three to four million people. Three to four million people 11,000 years ago. Three to four million people comprise the entire human population of all of the six inhabited continents and lived in small bands of hunter-gatherers ever active in trying to find means to survive in a world that was supporting them, but also could be very hostile and dangerous. <clears throat> As agriculture developed, people began to store food to tide over unfavorable seasons, and then they could stay in one place. They didn't have to keep moving in search of food or living a kind of a pastoral existence. And as they lived in one place, they began to form villages, uh, towns, and cities. And in those villages and towns and cities were formed the beginnings of everything that we regard now as human culture, with very few earlier exceptions and carryovers. And so music, law, 
science, philosophy, storytelling, uh, political, religious leaders, and all the other things that make up modern society originated over the last 11,000 years. Written language, in other words, everything that the Academia Sinica studies and essentially, uh, aside from prehistory and uh, everything that we enjoy that make up the fabric of our daily lives. As that developed, written languages were formed about 5,000 years ago. Uh, but first in uh, Babylonia, Syria, cuneiform writing, and along the Nile in Egypt with hieroglyphics. The hieroglyphics went only short distances up and down the Nile, really, but the cuneiform language gave rise to all the other European languages. Uh, when written languages were formed, people began to write down things that happened as they happened, but when they tried to write about things that happened earlier, they depended on storytellers I find that, uh, and, and the imagination changed on and on, and stories became more and more metaphorical. And I could find even in my own life, then when I look back on things that I did in my 20s, and then I look back and see what actually happened, my memory has often changed them a fair amount. So when people were writing, for example, the Bible about 3,000 years ago and looking back, not only on whatever they had that was written, but on whatever they had that wasn't written and trying to write it down, they obviously had to represent in the best way that they could what they imagined had happened before the time of uh, King David's court, for example, in Jerusalem. Now, world population growth has been explosive since uh, the time that agriculture was invented. At the time of Christ, it was about 2,000 years ago, which we base our calendar on. It's estimated to have been about 300 million people. At the time of the Reverend Thomas Malthus in England saying that our production of food could not keep pace with our population growth, it was about 850 million people. Uh, and uh, of course, what helped us to keep, didn't entirely solve the problem, but helped us to keep pace with it, were the invention, was the Industrial Revolution, the things that came from the Industrial Revolution, including the invention of mechanized plows, the ability to move water more easily from place to place, and particularly uh, the synthesis, the, the ability to make synthetic fertilizers and other chemicals used to improve agricultural productivity. The global population didn't reach one billion people into 1804, and you can see by successive marks there, successive billions. Uh, the global population is now at about 7.07 .07 billion people. And what is truly frightening, look at the stretch between 2011 and 2025 or 2043. Uh, from now until 2043, 2045, about 2 billion people will be added to the world population. About 1 billion people will be added in the next 12 years. Uh, about 500,000 of them in sub 500 million of them in sub-Saharan Africa, which at present has a population of about 950 million people, and where 500 million more will be added during the next 12 years, which is sub-Saharan Africa being virtually unmanageable now in terms of producing food and feeding the poor, even though significant advances are being made, is facing an even more difficult future. Two other ways of looking at this population growth are that when some of us were born in the 1930s, there was a certain number of people, about 2.4 billion in the world population, and now, as we move on into uh, 
a mature middle age will say euphemistically, uh, there are three people alive for every one who was alive when we were born. And what is even more frightening or needs our attention is that if you, if you visualize everyone in the world as sitting down to dinner every night, tonight there will be 200,000 more people sitting down to dinner than there were last night. Two days from now there'll be 400,000 more than there were today and the drive will go on, even though the world in, in percentage figures passed its, its biggest population increase per year in 1971, the base has gotten larger and larger, and the numbers continue to rise just astronomically, which mean that whatever problems we have now are, are much more difficult than we imagine they are. Now, population is often regarded as the major <clears throat> driving problem, and of course, population is fundamental. But population is by no means the only problem. The world is changing because of cities growing outward, and this is particularly difficult since cities were often formed in places where there was rich and abundant agricultural land which is why the cities were put there in the first place. And as they spread outward, they're knocking off huge amounts of additional rich agricultural land. So for example, in mainland China, uh, during this 20 year period, 250 million people are moving into cities of a million or more people. And in doing so, they'll be using up even more of the fertile land around the cities. So for instance, if you think about Hangzhou, Suzhou, Shanghai, and so forth, um, uh, and even Nanjing, the size of those cities just gets bigger and bigger, and that's a lot of the very best agricultural land in China. Another way of looking at the human population is a picture from space rolled out from multiple copies where the light is, and there are, there are uh, very obvious evidences there of the density of people in our planet. One of the interesting points about this map that you might not notice and which I, which I could see on a recent visit, which I noticed on a recent visit to Pyongyang, is that North Korea is entirely unelectrified aside from a few major cities and so South Korea actually looks like an island there, which is, kind of, which is kind of funny and interesting, but it's not at all funny for the people who live in North Korea. The population that we have now, which is growing by two to two and a half billion people over the next 40 years, is already racked with many, many problems, poverty, disease, drought, and famine. The levels of consumption of different people in different parts of the world differ drastically. For example, this is what a family in Western Europe consumes in the way of food in a week, uh, which is much more, as we'll show, than their countries can produce. And this is what a family in West Africa consumes in a week. There are about, of the seven billion of us now, there are about one billion who are malnourished to the extent that their bodies and minds do not, their minds do not, their brains do not develop properly when they're children, and their bodies are continually wasting away when they're adults. And of course, Taiwan has now gone up towards the upper end of the consumption spectrum, which is something that I want to return to later in a global context, and something that is very important for everyone to keep in mind. Another driver in the instability, in the insustainability of the world are the uses of technologies which were very good when they were first developed, like burning coal and burning oil and fossil fuels and many production of chemicals, but which produce conditions now that are clearly causing the world to move further and further away from sustainability. 
with the world not seeming to be able to do very much about it. Now biodiversity, uh, which is the total number of pl plants, animals, and fungi, and microorganisms with which we share the world, is essential for our lives. And we, if we are to build global sustainability, we have to build it not on the basis of more silicon wafers, but on the basis of biological diversity and the properties of living organisms. Yet we're driving those living organisms to extinction at an unprecedented rate. The last time so many of them were becoming extinct in such a short period was at the end of the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago, and now we human beings are the only force that's continuing to drive them to extinction. And we need to consider how the process can be slowed down for our own benefit uh, in the future. We cherish biodiversity because all of our food is produced uh, by biodiversity. In fact, all of our food is produced directly or indirectly by plants. Uh, it, may surprise, it may or may not surprise you to know that 103 kinds of plants provide 90% of our food directly or indirectly. And there are about 400,000 of them total, many thousands of which have been used for food by somebody at some time and which might have a great deal of utility in the future. Three kinds of plants, rice, wheat, and maize, corn, uh, produce 60% of our food directly or indirectly. So we're using only a very small amount of the diversity that's available to produce food for people on Earth, which is one reason that we show we can depend on it and like to keep it around. In addition, the genetic diversity of our crops is extremely important. Um, one of the ways that I often show this by analogy is saying that if <coughs> Uh, avian flu virus entered this room and was spreading, it would affect only a small number of people. Why? If you look around you, you can see that the human race is hugely diverse. If a, if a comparable pathogen enters a cultivated field that's completely genetically homogeneous, the effects are much more extensive, which illustrates why the kind of diversity uh, symbolized by the contents of a m corn crib in central Mexico is so important for the future. In addition, two-thirds of the people in the world, including the great majority of people in both China and India, depend directly on plants as their source of medicine. And even for those of us who buy drugs in the prescription drugs or drugs in the drugstore, one quarter of them, and we'll look at a couple of examples in a minute, one quarter of them were originally derived from plants or are still taken from plants, and another quarter were originally derived from fungi or are still taken from fungi or bacteria. So half of our prescription drugs have natural origins as well as two-thirds of the people in the world using plants directly as medicine. In the age of molecular biology, we have to remember two sides of the question. Understanding genes, the way that they function and the way they produce the phenotype of an adult organism, depends on comparisons between different organisms and different genes in different organisms. On the other hand, uh, so that the diversity of organisms uh, makes possible, the genetic diversity of organisms in a sense makes possible the diversity of uh, the, the, our understanding of molecular biology. But on the other side, whatever we're going to build as a result of molecular biology, which as um, we all know is a science itself only 50 years old really from the 1960s, will depend on the ability to find different kinds of genes and different kinds of transcription and different kinds of protein formation and on and on in other kinds of organisms, in diverse kinds of organisms. And the fewer we have, the less adept we can be in doing that. 
And of course, the recent uh, uh, announcement or discovery that the so-called uh, junk portions of the chromosomes are filled with genes that are effective in, in regulating the, <coughs> the activity of the genes in the part of the chromosomes that seem to be active. Not surprising if you're a biologist because things won't be wasted, but on the other hand, it's a huge discovery. And of course, another very recent field, recent in the, in the degree to which we understand it, epigenetics is also having a huge effect on the way we think about molecular biology at the present time. Organisms collectively control the, the flow of water. They control the landslides in central Taiwan uh, they control the keeping of topsoil, they control the fertility of the soil, they set local climates, and they have an enormous impact by providing what are called ecosystem services. In addition, a very large proportion of the foods we eat are pollinated by organisms that live in that, that are part of the rest of biodiversity and could be regarded as part of the ecosystem services. Not to be missed is the fact that the beauty of organisms, the way in which we enjoy seeing them, the way in which we feel better if we're in a room that has a plant in it, or we enjoy the beauty of flowers, or we enjoy having a pet, or we enjoy having a fish in an aquarium, shows a kind of an ethical or philosophical relationship with organisms that enriches and nurtures our entire lives, which is really basically why we like to go for walks in the woods and see different kinds of places. A few examples of why every species matters. Aspirin was first developed by people noting that Europeans were chewing willow bark and then soon isolated and synthesized in a form that would uh, not uh, burn out the in inside of your stomach, which was a convenient thing. The venom from the green mamba, which is a deadly poisonous African snake, may provide a drug to prevent kidney failure during treatment for acute heart failure, where the treatments for acute heart failure have to make your kidneys fail and then you die. Uh, it's already come up, uh, it, it comes up in the, uh, in the uh, introductory film for Academia Sinica that warfarin or Coumadin, which so many of us take for high blood pressure, was first discovered in a in a bale of moldy sweet clover and uh, of course is a powerful rat poison and effective blood thinner. Guar seeds, guar is a legume that's cultivated in India, provide ingredients for the materials used for fracking, for breaking up rocks and extracting oil and natu natural gas from them, used widely in the US and elsewhere. And very kind of interestingly and strangely, it's recently been discovered that the yeasts that occur on grapes come back every year and make the grapes of particular areas have their distinctive aromas and tastes are taken away by wasps to their colonies during the winter and then re-brought out by the wasps to the maturing grapes and they're ready to be stomped into the delicious uh, wines that can be made from them and that differ so much from place to place. However, the species are disappearing very rapidly, unfortunately, while we're just beginning to learn about ways in which they can be useful and ways in which their integrated activities make life on Earth possible, they're disappearing because of habitat loss. Oops, back because of habitat loss, which is the major cause of extinction, because of air and water pollution, and of course, 40 years ago in Taiwan, pollution from many small factories was really widespread, but has largely been brought under control, fortunately, because of alien invasive species, pests and diseases, which come in and knock off biological diversity, because of extensive, hu excessive hunting, 
Think of bushmeat in Africa or think of all the turtles in Southeast Asia being caught to bring them into China so they can be eaten there uh, and uh, overgrazing. And now, very importantly, and we'll say a bit more about it for that reason, global warming, which is second only to habitat loss and may during the course of this century emerge as the major reason for biological extinction. So clearing uh, of habitat for a whole variety of reasons uh, destroys many species. And I'll say what we know about species later, but we've named about 1.9 million of an estimated 12 million species of eukaryotic organisms. And that means that if you clear tropical rainforest, about 19 out of 20 kinds of organisms will never have been given a name, will be completely unknown. And look at this scene, and I'll return to this theme. It's great that forestry in Taiwan has been outlawed for a number of years. It's, it's awful, as everybody knows, that in the Japanese period here, so much of the wood was taken away to Japan and so many forests were killed. But on the other hand, all the wood that you import to Taiwan, which is virtually all the wood you use except bamboo, is taken somewhere else and is driving instability and the extinction of species there. And the point that I'll be making as I go on, one of the major points is that Taiwan needs to be sustainable itself, but it cannot be sustainable if the world is not sustainable so that all the countries from which you obtain things have to be considered also in terms of their sustainability or it simply comes to an end. There's no more wood, there's no more anything, there's no more things to import, people are just poor. Women and children in the developing world spend most of their lives gathering and bringing in water or firewood and in doing so are completely deprived of their position in society and, and also sort of totally denied the possibility of getting an education. This is a completely unjust situation and one that the world really needs to rectify as part of its effort to gain overall global sustainability because we need the individual contributions of their minds uh, and and we can never get them either for the benefit of their own area or for the benefit of the whole world if all they do is this. Now here's a map of the destruction of tropical forest worldwide and you can see that uh, tropical lowland forest has been most heavily destroyed in, in uh, Southeast Asia with huge flows of wood going to China, Taiwan, Japan and elsewhere in the world and with relatively little forest left, so we can know that there's been an enormous amount of extinction there. It's spreading rapidly in Africa, and Latin America is the last area that still has substantial uh, lowland forest, uh, but it's going pretty rapidly too, even though in Latin America they've come closer to sustainable population and doing the other things that are necessary to win sustainability. Uh, you have a wonderful example of invasive species here in uh, Mycania micrantha, which is uh, a relatively recent uh, outbreak, I guess 20 years, it's been spreading in Taiwan and now covers huge areas all over the lowlands of the island and is spreading up into higher and higher elevations. And as you can see, nothing else in that community has much chance of getting anywhere this is an example of a pest. This is southern oak death, Quercus, which is killing oak trees and, uh, and changing the characters of the forests in the Pacific coast of, uh, of uh, North America from California northward. It's a Phytophthora fungus that's introduced from elsewhere. And this is the emerald ash borer, which is killing all of the trees of Fraxinus in the northeastern United States and spreading through the United States and it comes from uh, Asia. Uh, what I want to point out, and this is I think very important in terms of what I'll say later is, 
there are completely insufficient numbers of specialists in different groups of biodiversity in Asia. Uh, for example, this is uh, Buprestidae, but in the beetle family, Scolididae, which are the ones that engrave the burrows underneath the bark of trees, uh, and which are the major, probably the major pest of forest trees and for forestry. Uh, there are about, there's no, there, there's one retired specialist on the, fa and there are about 20,000 species, there's one retired specialist on the family in Taiwan, there are none in mainland China, and there's one retired specialist on the family in Japan, and yet this is a family that's causing enormous damage all over the world, and of course if you want to talk about fungi, which are the major destroyers of anything built of cellulose in the world. Uh, in the United States, we, you could point out that fungi in the Pacific Theater caused more damage to the American war effort in World War II than all the Japanese military actions put together. Uh, and yet the number of specialists, people really knowledgeable about fungi and able to apply that information in the world is very, very poor. And I would very much urge Academia Sinica and uh, the, the Tessery, the, in, the Endemic Species Research Institute, to think very hard and very carefully about what kind of specialists are needed from both scientific and uh, economic reasons in order to handle biodiversity, which we're smashing to pieces uh, intelligently. This is both ecologically in terms of sustainability and in terms of more immediate economics incredibly important. And then I just put a picture of ginseng as one of the plants that's overgathered in nature and just sort of coming to be accepted as a cultivated plant. I was interested in a recent visit to uh, mainland China to have people saying they prefer cultivated ginseng from Wisconsin because that used to be like nothing, like bad stuff. So the transition is being made, but still in China and India, only about one-sixth of all the plants that are used as medicine are actually grown in cultivation. All the others are gathered or overgathered in the world, in the wild, in nature. And given the increased interest in all these herbs in the industrial world, in Europe, Japan, uh, the United States, Canada, and so forth, the pressure on them has gone up monumentally. And then there's global warming, making it harder and harder, presumably for the polar bear on the right to jump over to join his friend on the left. But joking aside, these are various scenarios for global warming. Uh, as you see, this goes back to the year 1000. The last red line um, there is, this is all determined by satellite and, and world, world uh, uh, calibration. So, and here are various scenarios for uh, global warming. Uh, at the last meeting on global warming, uh, people agreed to revisit the subject in 2020, which is a scandalous situation to begin with, and they talk about a two degree Celsius world, but people who actually work with global warming think a two degree Celsius world is completely unattainable, and that a three degree world might be attainable somewhere around here, uh, but on the other hand, there's very little evidence that people are doing anything about the burning of fossil fuels much, uh, much less the uh, uh, logging of forests and the release of carbon dioxide from the forests and all the other things that are going on. And so we could hit a five degree world. And I'd state right now that in or more, there's nothing that will stop it there if we don't begin to be active. And I'll state right now that in a five degree world, uh, mollusks, oysters, clams, and so forth, and shell and uh, shrimp, lobsters, and so forth, will be unable to form their shells in the ocean. 
uh, for instance, and we'll all start disappearing massively. And you know, that's the kind of thing we have to face, which makes it a complete scandal that the United States has defaulted on leadership in the area of addressing global warming when probably it's the one country that could really drive Europe and Japan and the other countries to uh, action. But of course, you can't do anything about that except give a moral example, act internally to do whatever you can, and give a moral example to the rest of the world. Pat and I traveled with a group of scientists to Shishmaref Island in the Arctic Ocean on the north shore of Alaska to study, to see firsthand the effects of global warming, and the group also included uh, religious leaders and so forth because we wanted to see it and talk about it together. And what we found is that this island, which has been inhabited for 6,000 years, has shoreline has receded by 200 meters and the village itself is falling into the ocean block by block as the permafrost melts off, which is pretty frightening. Uh, Headlines uh, two weeks ago indicated that Arctic ice has shrunk this year to an all-time low. Uh, the 30-year average is the yellow line, and you can see where it is now, which is uh, absolutely amazing, uh, on September 16th. And that was 18% uh, six, lower than the earlier low four years earlier, which in turn was 22% less than the low before that, and so it looks like all the Arctic ice is going to be gone very soon, and of course that's very scary, both because the water absorbs more heat if it's bare, uh, and also because it just indicates that ice melt is going faster, and you know, the ultimate point is that if all the ice in the world melted, uh, the, on, on big sheets in Antarctica, in Greenland, in the Arctic and all, there would be an 80 meter rise in sea level around the world. Now, 80 meters is pretty severe and pretty intolerable, but the question becomes, with a big lag effect in the effects of our actions, where we begin to deal with this. Here are some projections of farming in a warmer world. Remember that a billion people in the world are already malnourished, and the darker brown it is, the poorer farming will be in the future. It'll be better in the dark gray, but as you can see, the losses hugely offset the uh, gains, and in fact, indicate the urgent need for improvements in agriculture right now, because where are we gonna get the food all of the alpine and subalpine habitats in the United States with permanent snow fields or ice fields or glaciers in the lower 48 states will be gone according to climate projections and no matter which projection is followed by the end of this century during the next few decades really and of course that's where Taiwan comes in very strongly also as Guo Fang ha Chung has shown, uh, and as those of you who work with this will know, the number of species uh, in Taiwan decreases with elevation, but the proportion of endemic species in Taiwan increases with elevation so that the dark bars on the left are the numbers of species that are found only in Taiwan at each elevation. These are plants, but animals, to the extent that we know about them, follow these rules. So that when you get up to the uh, alpine regions, 3950, near the tops of the mountains, 60% of all the species are found only in Taiwan. And when you're down in the lowlands, which have been, of course, the most damaged ecosystem as human activities and farming and all have spread, uh, the corresponding figure is about one-sixth are found only in Taiwan. So here's the upward increase in the proportion of plant endemics in Taiwan. And here are some of the beautiful flowers that occur in those alpine and subalpine regions. And here's an example of the research that's being done partly at the, uh, uh, at the uh, 
Academia Sinica and C.H. Joe, who's here, uh, is uh, uh, certainly an active person in investigating this phenomenon. Uh, and the picture is not pretty because it shows that all the trends indicate that most or all of those alpine and subalpine species are likely to disappear uh, during the course of the next few decades. And the future of those communities is very, very dim. Uh, here's a, a plant in the same family as celery or parsley that Guofang studied. Chirophyllum in volucratum, it grows under those tall conifers uh, on Mount Snow. Uh, here is its present distribution. The, the dots are, uh, are uh, places where it's been collected now, and the dark area is the sort of area of potential range. Here are its past distributions. The last glacial maximum is projected by climates at that time, and you can see it was considerably uh, larger than it is now, and it's been pulled into its present area. But here's the really damaging calculation, which shows that uh, under the six different climate scenarios shown there, which are like the ones shown on the earlier slide, uh, the species will completely disappear or nearly disappear in about half of them. And you know, the, the, the drive goes on. We don't really know how warm it's going to be, but it's very, very, very bad for the future of those organisms and it can be demonstrated very clearly as it has been in other parts of the world. As to sea level rise, the sea level has been rising since about 1850 as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And ironically, by the way, it was in 1895 that Swedish Nobel Prize winner Arrhenius first pointed out that greenhouse gases uh, would drive global warming in 1895, which we're still arguing about it. And again, here's sea level, here's sea level uh, by satellite in the, in the red bar. These are calculated by summing other kinds of figures. And it goes on directly. According to the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, sea level is likely to rise 1.8 meters during the remainder of this century with it accelerating as it goes along. Um, this and it, and it could be more. Most of the surprises we get are worse. And if you consider some of the ways people are living, like these villages on the Mekong River, and then think about what a 1.8 in southern Vietnam, and then you think about what a 1.8 degree, 1.8 meter rise in sea level would do, uh, you can see why, for example, Vietnam has calculated losing uh, one-third of all of its rice-producing land to sea level rise over the coming decades. Uh, and the Minister of Agriculture here, who we talked to yesterday, estimates at least 10% will be lost in Taiwan for similar reasons. And so everything that's going on makes it more difficult to know where the food is going to come from to right injustices and help to produce a sustainable world. Mainland China, for the three major industrial zones on the coast, has calculated that 30% of each of those zones is going to be lost during the course of this century and is taking uh, heavy steps to prepare, the, to re replicate them uh, internally further away from the sea and at higher elevations. But the point is it's still got to stop at some point and there is a serious lag effect and the fact that governments are now totally stuck and talking about coming back to the picture in 2020 is completely unacceptable in terms of human welfare. Somebody said ironically at a meeting that Pat and I just intended that what we need would probably be an international group, something like a Union of Nations or a United Nations that could address this. But as you know, the United Nations is totally devoted in its central activities to matters of war and peace, and all of its environmental activities are in peripheral agencies like UNDP and UNEP, and they really need to be centralized because we really need a way for the world to deal with this collector collectively. 
Global Footprint Network, which has a website of, of uh, footprintnetwork.org, has compared uh, biocapacity, how much bioproductive area is available to each one of us with ecological footprint, which is how much bioproductive area do we demand, and we demand it for a whole variety of different reasons. Uh, forest, uh, uh, carbon, uh, grazing land, farmland, cities, urban land, marine things, and so forth. And using this, look up footprintnetwork.org and you can calculate your, your uh, individual consumption. You can calculate the consumption of Taipei. You can calculate the consumption of Taiwan and see where you are in relation to what you can produce. We already use an estimated 45% of the total products of photosynthesis in the world on a continuing basis, directly or indirectly. We use about 55% of the sustainable supplies of fresh water in the world on a continuing basis. And we're one species out of tens of millions of others. And if you add them all up and use the formulas on the network, we're now using 150% of what the world can produce on an ongoing basis. And that means very clearly that if you thought of it in terms of a bank account, we're consuming the principle. We're progressively making the world less and less sustainable as time goes on, less diverse and harder to find our feet again for sustainability. In 1970, 40 years ago, we were using 70% estimated by the same formulas to be using 70% of the total productivity. And with us now using 150% of what the world can produce, what are we going to do with two to two and a half billion more people? And this just reviews the problems in the world at the present day. 100, 100, uh, 100 million people are on the verge of starvation at any given point. Now here's ecological footprint in hectares per capita, productive hectares per person, the ecological footprint, how hard do you use them? And as you go up on that, uh, you have uh, uh, countries that, uh, pr the, the darker the color, the more the country uses. And if you compare that one, with the, well, I've got them backwards, I think, just a minute. No, just a minute. This shows the intensity of land use in different countries. This one shows which countries uh, imported things to support their standard of living in 1961. And the darker the green, the, the relatively more they were self-sufficient. And this shows the same picture in 2005. The darker, the more intense colors import countries that import more than they can produce internally. Now, as you view these next uh, images, they compare ecological footprint with biocapacity, biocapacity being the productivity of the country. And as you can see, in Great Britain, the two haven't come together, a typical colonial power that reached its uh, zenith in about 1850. You can see that uh, they haven't been anywhere near enough productivity or enough biocapacity to support the population that they've developed uh, sent really since the middle of the 19th century. And then here's the United States. We were producing more than we could consume until, as you can see, the late 1960s. And now the lines have diverged uh, remarkably. We import that much. And look, uh, the average available worldwide is about two hectares per capita. So we're using about four times the, what the world can actually afford per person with the present population of seven billion people if the distribution was to be equitable and destroying the biocapacity of the country as we go along. And here's China. 
you can see that China has very past its ability to produce. Uh, in this case, in the late 1970s, uh, and these are this is the ecological footprint worldwide, and this is the capacity. But remember that that's the amount available per person uh, worldwide, about two hectares. And if you go back and look at the United States, that it's a very, very different level per capita. And then India, sort of similar, has been importing for a long time. But notice that in India, this is one hectare per person, and it's going down rapidly, and the populate and the ecological footprint is like that. And the population of India is projected by the middle of this century to grow from 1.2 billion to 1.7 billion, surpassing China. And when you look at that diagram, think about what that will mean since there are more poor people in India now than in any other country in the world. This is a very interesting diagram. It compares uh, uh, ecological footprint with the hectares, uh, with the uh, Uh, with Human Development Index on the left, and, and you see here's the U.S., Norway, Canada, Australia, uh, but that red line is how much land is available worldwide per person for productivity to support people. So all of these countries are way on the other side of the line, and Taiwan must be somewhere in here, China probably somewhere in here. But notice Cuba, which is a very interesting exception, which uh, being so isolated has somehow managed its own affairs in interesting ways to both have a high standard of living and to be rather uh, sustainable. Uh, there are, as I said before, there's very poor knowledge about the organisms on Earth. And yet they're becoming extinct at, a, at this very rapid rate, and I won't go through the details of that image. Uh, they're becoming extinct at about that rate so that half of all the species on Earth, with exceptions that I'll talk about, could be gone by the end of this century, which is almost unimaginable. So what can we do? We can discover and document what we have now we can set aside natural areas and protect them. We can bring endangered species into cultivation, and of course that refers to plants, and to a limited degree we can bring endangered animals into uh, uh, captivity too, and when possible reintroduce them, combat alien invasive species, and provide alternatives to gathering species in nature. So here's inventory going on in Madagascar, looking for medicinal plants, and you can see the traveler's palms, Ravenella there over the people. Here's a botanist from the Missouri Botanical Garden training Peruvians to do inventories of their national park. This is CSIRO in Australia, uh, doing a survey of the insects in Queensland, one place in Queensland, and then Rapidly, the, the next step is getting that material out for consumption and activity. We can use new tools like molecular analysis in figuring out what species we're looking at. We can use new tools like uh, geographical information systems, GIS systems, to find out uh, what areas are most important for conservation? And this is the district, those are all endemic spe tree species in the Western Ghats in India. And then you can rapidly now with computers convert that into finding out which spots you'd conserve to save the most species most effectively, which is very important in an area so heavily populated. Parks can be set aside and disturbed areas as around cities or around farms and the like, which is something that uh, certainly the uh, Council on Agriculture is paying attention to here in Taiwan, can be important refuges for the survival of species. And bringing people into the equation is all important. I'm editing a book that was started by the late Navdat Sodi of University of Singapore, uh, called Voices from the Tropics, which is people all over the tropical world talking about how they see conservation. And 
they see the need to incorporate more human activities in the preservation of the communities if it's going to happen. We can bring uh, uh, plants into cultivation in botanical gardens, something that could be developed further in Taiwan, but with some good developments, for example, in the Ministry of Forestry, which uh, has three of them going. We can bring animals, if we're interested enough, we can bring animals in also, but the giant panda costs several million dollars a year, and certainly any vertebrate, any terrestrial vertebrate would probably cost one to two hundred thousand dollars a year, so it's, it's uh, very difficult. We don't have the equivalent of seeds. Uh, but uh, when you see a picture like that, and that one was taken by my wife, Patricia, like many of the other pictures that you've seen, when you see a picture like that, then you can understand why people are willing to spend a lot of money to preserve them. But when you consider that there are 10 million of them that don't even have names, uh, then you realize the size of the task. For plants, seed banks at low temperatures are a very good solution in a rapidly changing world. And we've had a seminar here in Taiwan over the, or during the earlier part of this week uh, advising about methods of plant conservation and protection. And uh, uh, for one thing, having the best experts in the world to recommend cryopreservation of seeds, of certain kinds of seeds at about minus 176 degrees Celsius, which allows us to preserve many kinds of seeds that we couldn't preserve otherwise. Uh, so we like the, the seed bank that we're urging that Tessery develop, and we have the uh, uh, somewhat support from the administration in doing this, and we hope it can move right forward. Uh, should have all the modern methods of uh, seed protection as well as, uh, as, well as the well-known ones. To have a proper preservation of organisms, you need a wide range of their genetics, need to use those modern methods, and you just have a policy because obviously in the alpine and subalpine parts of Taiwan, uh, if we don't get out there during the next 5, 10, 15 years, there are really going to be lots and lots of losses. It's not something that we can sort of consider uh, carefully for a long period of time. Uh, combating invasives is really important. This is a, an American uh, tropical invasive that's very common in Asia, and seeing that man trying to get through the little channel in the water hyacinth gives you an idea of how strong it is. But preserving species won't work in any more than preserving Taiwan won't work unless you look at the bigger picture. Global warming has got to be limited. It, it won't be reversed for thousands of years because the gases simply stay up there, but it's got to be limited and brought to a halt. Alternative energy sources, social justice, empowering people, especially women and children throughout the world, reaching a stable population and developing new technologies are all very important strategies in the bigger picture. Uh, footprint Network, Global Footprint Network uh, calculates, and this is another interesting way of putting what we've already talked about, that on at the, end of August, at the end of August in 2011, we had already used up all the productive capacity of the world for that year. And remember, that includes things that are brought into, you might say Taiwan hasn't, but that's only because of all the things that are coming in from elsewhere. Uh, and if you look at the world collectively, uh, that's what it looks like September 27th. This year it was August, uh, something like August 28th when we'd used up all the productive capacity of the world. Now, if we want to reach stability, you see, we're already using, in effect, the productivity of one and a half planets, and we haven't got one and a half planets. If we don't do anything, we run up to 2.2 planets, and only a rigorous uh, reduction in many of our activities will lead us to a kind of a stability. See, here's stability. Here's what the world really produces. And that's very important. Uh, it's something that we hardly can think about because it's sort of too big, and yet it's very important. 
We've got to alleviate poverty worldwide and bring people onto a level playing field in order to find stability. We've got to, there's huge differences between the places that we could find stability. That's where we are now. And this is four degrees, which many people would say is a plausible world, but it's a world in which nature and productivity would be enormously disrupted. There's six degrees uh, Fahrenheit, or of course 3.4 degrees Celsius difference between those two, which is an enormous difference and really one that will be determined by choice. But we've got to make that choice as soon as possible, and Taiwan could at least be a, an example and a moral example in getting there. If we don't collectively concern ourselves with the fate of that Tibetan girl gathering firewood in Nepal, uh, we've, uh, we, we'll never get to stability simply because there will be areas of the world that will be so unstable and so poor that we can't build a wall. We're all on the same planet. We've got to find a way to solve this all together. Uh, this is an example of empowering women, teaching women in the Western Ghats in India to take their own drugs out of amla, one of the important medicinal herbs there, instead of just passing it on unprocessed to middlemen. We've got to find alternative energy, not only standard alternative energy like uh, uh, solar panels, but better inventions than that. And we have to devote a huge amount of energy to being sure that our children are sensitive to the environment because therein lies a lot of our future. Now here's what I would consider urgent recommendations for Taiwan. Uh, one, you're losing biodiversity very rapidly already, and uh, it is absolutely urgent to preserve as much as possible as quickly and efficiently as possible. And uh, what's now called the Endemic Species Research Institute within the Department of Agriculture uh, seems, and will be renamed next year, Seed Biodiversity Institute, seems to be the logical coordinating body. But in order for it to succeed, the Academia Seneca Institutes, the universities, the people of Taiwan who love biodiversity so much have got to all be involved in the problem. Taiwan needs to attain internal sustainability as rapidly as possible, and you are uh, trying very hard, trying relatively hard to do that at the present time, but it needs more. It needs more urgency and more of a push. Uh, we hope that the sustainability center being formed inside Academia Seneca will be able to make a contribution to that. But we ought to lead our lives sustainably. We ought to let our institutions be as sustainable as they can be. And we ought to work for Taiwan's sustainability. That means considering what levels of consumption can be maintained and how they can be maintained, which is both an internal and an external calculation. It means that neither Taiwan nor the United States nor Europe nor anywhere else can simply run off to ever higher levels of consumption and hope to have a sustainable world in which people can live just lives. Uh, and Taiwan needs to carefully consider, and I've been saying this for a very long time, but it's a very hard thing to do, needs to carefully consider the consequences of the global economy on its future stability. The thing is, if Taiwan made uh, five times the money that was made during the Silicon Wafer period, or 10 times the money, or 20 times the money, if the whole world was unsustainable and had nothing to export, you still wouldn't be any better off. You're part of a global system, and only by realizing that you're part of a global system and to the extent that you can, acting on it, thinking about it, being sustainable internally and promoting sustainability throughout the world, can you in the long run, in fact in the relatively short run, maintain a, an acceptable and sustainable level of life for the people who live in Taiwan now? Uh, and, you know, that 
everyone looks at modernizing science, making the best possible discoveries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But even if they're all made in Taiwan and you have all this to sell, there has to be something to buy and it has to be sustainable too. Every time a ship like that loads up in Malaya on its way to Taiwan, the world is the loser. It's fine like China has done, like Taiwan has done to bar internal logging, but it doesn't really help to build world sustainability. It just helps to build local sustainability. Japan has a much larger forested area and much more square cubic feet of uh, cubic meters of wood standing now than it did at the beginning of World War II. But uh, all the places that all that wood came from that they actually used, including of course Taiwan, are the losers. And so we're all the losers. Those are some of the points that I would like you to think about as a result of this analysis. It's an, it's an extraordinary honor to be named an honorary academician of Academia Sinica, and it will be my pleasure and joy to help in any way that I can in the accomplishment of these or other more modest goals that may contribute towards them. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, uh, do you allow uh, several questions? Sure. Okay. And uh, now, uh, is there any uh, question or comments for uh, uh, Dr. Peter, Reverend? Any comments? I'm pro nuclear energy and pro GM crops. Maybe that'll get some <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes. The, yes. The, the chair. It seems the picture you give is very blank <laughs> overall in terms of the future of human being or the, the earth. Uh, my question is, it seems even up to now, people's philosophy still, I'm particularly in economy, still based on growth, growth and competition and uh, consuming. And if we continue this way, situation will be even worse and still better. So do you think it's possible to reverse this way of thinking worldwide? If just one country or just Taiwan is not going to help that much. Well, I think we are reducing it. If you look at the level of environmental consciousness in the United States as it was in the 1940s at the end of World War II and what it is now, there's no comparison. And the important thing that I think we have to remember is that the world is not coming to an end it's simply becoming less diverse, more homogeneous, and with fewer opportunities. And at some point, it will come to an end because we can't go on consuming more than the world can produce. You might think that technology and science provide ways to escape this, but we once had a, an important discussion, the US National Academy of Sciences with the Royal Society, and we unanimously concluded that although science and technology have a huge amount to contribute to sustainability, they can't solve these problems. There is no solution to these problems unless population reaches a level point and overall consumption reaches a level point. You can understand the reasons for that. If human population increased a certain amount per year indefinitely, it would eventually reach, it would eventually result in a mass of human bodies spreading away from the surface of the earth at the speed of light. So somewhere between here and there, it's gotta, it's gotta become, it's gotta become stable, um, um, you know, um, if you analyze how many people the world can support, then it, then it just all depends on the kind of life you want to have those people living. And what it really means is that since it will become stabilized at some point, that your contribution and my contribution and the contribution of every person in this room, domestically and internationally, is very important in deciding what kind of a final outcome there will be the world will never again be as rich in biological species, as diverse as it is now. 
in any way, but the world can be as good as we decide to make it. And in our positive ability to affect the outcome, I find a great deal of hope. You did mention that the population will keep on going up until 2050, we'll reach nine or 10 billion people and people always take that number as sometime in the future, population will stabilize. And India always said that, that by 2050, they will catch up with Taiwan and population will be stabilized. But my worry is that it might be too late. 2050 might be too late. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I think it's important to keep looking at it as a, as a graduated outcome. In that sense, it's never too late. I mean, India, uh, uh, just thank your lucky stars that you're not the prime minister of India. I mean, its situation is drastic. I mean, one third of the sewage from Delhi is treated before they dump it into the river. Uh, right now, and diseases of unknown and alarming proportion are growing. And although a middle class is gaining in India, the number of poor people is so enormous that they may be overwhelmed. But in, it's too late to achieve a lot of things, but it's not too late to make the outcome be as good as it can be if we're determined to do that and don't feel overcome. That's the way I'd put it. Yeah. When I said it's too late, it's not the lack of effort of some part, but the way things are going, with carbon dioxide concentration now reach 390 ppm and increasing with 2 ppm per year. And everybody believed that the, when we reach 450 ppm, temperature will rise by 2 degrees centigrade before Industrial Revolution. That's the point we might get into discontinuity. Yeah, and yeah, that's right. So if we take that number into account, then we only have about 30 years. From yeah, now. oh yes, yeah. in terms of global warming, you're that's absolutely right. right. Yeah, 30 years. And of course, Jim Hansen in the United States and, other, and a number of others think it is too late for global warming, for some of the outcomes of global warming already. And that's why I said it's immoral and sort of mm -hmm. insane for people not to be dealing with it right now. Yeah. We may already be looking at a really major catastrophe there. Yeah. We are looking at a really major biological catastrophe in terms of the loss of species, but we seem even less able to deal with that than to deal with global warming, <laughs> which means we're really, given the scale of the problem, doing almost nothing. But even for global warming, the more we do, the better. And one could only hope that there would be some realistic people in the world who somehow could lead us to take it as seriously as it deserves to be taken. And as I say, the position of the United States is on, on it is only embarrassing because it's purely political theater and uh, it, it doesn't get the world anywhere. And people in future generations are going to pay a big price for that. We have one more question over there. Yes, please. Yes, microphone. Yeah, press. Press the button, the blue, green one. Oh, right here. Okay. So, uh, Professor, thank you for your talk. I totally agree with you that the world is interconnected. That, that's why I'm going to ask you a question, which you just mentioned about United States, because there's something that strikes me, um, you know, as very bizarre, is that half of the American populations, they live in denial. They don't believe there is global warming. So when you mentioned that you, you, you had this, this short, brief trip in uh, Alaska, you know, with a bunch of uh, religious leaders and you are trying to, you know, maybe persuade them that there is global warming and what can we do about it. So wh what I'm asking is that wh what can we do to, um, to make religious leaders and governments, you know, to take some actions because obviously, um, a lot of people don't even, you know, they just live in denial and they don't, they don't believe the, in, in the United States societies and it's always so polarized and politicized that 
maybe this there's a lot of uh, multi you know national cooperations lobbying the White House or you know Republican parties is behind some of it's this. Uh, uh, so I I just yeah. I just wondered that that you know how do you put this academic insight for word and into the levels of governments and you know policy making. Well, most of the denial in the United States is driven by coal and oil companies that are closely linked with some of the political parties. And obviously, the cynical position is the longer you can go on burning coal and oil, the more money you make. And if people are willing to accept that, then it will go on. Uh, a friend of mine put up a billboard uh, in a parched cornfield near St. Louis, which says, Global warming is real. Elect those who will deal with it. Uh, and then gives the NASA website. NASA has a very good website on global warming. There's no scientists in the United... In the scientific community in the United States is the same as the scientific community uh, elsewhere. But as Richard Nurse, you know, the president of the Royal Society, put it in an interview in the New York Times, uh, our ability to deal with a lot of these things stems from a misunderstanding of science. Uh, science uh, uh, is different. It's not political theater. It's not like sort of dialogue. Somebody said to somebody in the United States that uh, a scientist said, do you believe in global warming? He said, no, I reserve belief for important things like religion or ethics. Uh, Global warming is simply the conclusion of thousands of scientists around the world writing in the peer-reviewed literature and coming to the conclusion that the climate is warming and that human beings are the main force responsible. It's not a matter of belief at all. What you do about it is a matter of politics and economics, you know, how fast you move and all the rest. And on that, it probably only people can make the difference. Uh, I would say, though, that the uh, opinion in the United States is shifting, uh, shifted much more positively recently. And, you know, every, every political leader listens to the people, but of course, when some of the people have enormous amounts of money to contribute, then you may listen to them more closely, and that's true the world around. But uh, we've, got to, we've got to realize this in a popular way, and there are plenty of people trying to do that. I would also point out that the so-called evangelicals in the United States, conservative Christians, are very concerned about global warming. The reason they're concerned about it is they believe that you need to take care of the poor. And the burden of global warming, and that's something we all ought to be concerned with, because worldwide, the burden of global climate change falls much harder on poor people all over the world. Think of Bangladesh, or think of anything, think of the islands in the Pacific, than it does on any of the rest of us, uh, which, which, in, which again makes it a moral question. But are we willing to give up the myth that each of us can consume as much as we want without any limit, and that my family at least could get some advantage over your family by doing something else and getting some more money. Uh, Ed Wilson at Harvard has written a good new book called The Social Conquest of Earth, which I suggested that he write because I said, Ed, there must be a lot ingrained in people uh, before they started agriculture and before their numbers started to grow, ways that it was appropriate to behave when there were only three or four million people worldwide and which have become inappropriate. I think that the better we can understand that, maybe it can help us to do better also. But I tell you, uh, it won't be bad or good like turning on or off a light switch. It'll be, <coughs> it'll be worse but less worse if we each individually think about what we can do about it, both personally and in our institutions. So can I just follow up? So do you th are you saying that, that you think the U.S. government is making some significant change uh, on their attitude towards the Kyoto Protocol? Um, the U.S. people are changing I wouldn't say the U.S. government is changing yet. Both, both uh, George W. Bush 
and uh, Obama campaigned on paying more attention to global warming. Uh, George W. Bush, in about, about 40 days into office, decided not to do it when he was pressured by industry. Obama didn't do much about it either. Politics are short-lived. Oh, I mentioned another thing. Corporations are more apt to do something about this than government because corporations have got to return value to shareholders on an ongoing basis. And they can't afford to pretend that something isn't real that is real. You know, a lot of people talk about GM crops, another whole topic, and they say, these corporations are making all these poisonous things and putting them out. Well, why in the world would corporations want to make poisonous things and put them out? You know, it's, it's corporations want to make things that will go on making profits for them indefinitely, which is not to say they can't make mistakes and they can't be greedy and, you know, everything else, but it's, it's sort of a non sequitur. Unfortunately, politicians tend to be gone too soon, which is certainly not a call for dictatorship, but it's a call for informed citizenry. And, and uh, science education in high school, grammar school, and all of that, which is very, very good in Taiwan, uh, is very important also because people have to be able to look at these things critically. Um, as scientists, we have to always remember, too, that science doesn't tell you whether you can jump off the top of this building or not. It just tells you what will happen if you do, likely, with a certain probability, in that case, very high. Uh, question, please. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, for me, what I feel is we are talking uh, among people who are already convinced. I can see reusable container, I can see cup, but when I'm teaching environment in my class, I see plastic cup, bottles, everything, and somewhere I think that we do not provide the correct information to most people. We are talking between each other, we know about it, but the information doesn't reach the people that should be concerned. What well, I'd say two different it? things to that. Oh, you finished? Yes. I'd say two different things to that. Um, first of all, yes, indeed, we all have to work a lot harder to spread the word. But as to people being convinced, if people are really, if leading intellectuals and scientists and everybody else are so convinced, why haven't they changed things? It's not basically that they're frustrated and they've tried to change things. It's because each one of them, on the whole, each one of them considers themselves too busy with their day-to-day -day life and their professional advancement and all to spend any time convincing anybody. And we have to take that responsibility seriously individually, as I said several times, or it's just not going to happen. Uh, you only are really convinced when you act on your convictions. If you don't act on your convictions, you shouldn't claim to be convinced. Um, as you already uh, learned from uh, Dr. Peter Ravens, if you look at this and uh, about the lecture, he, he described that um, uh, Dr. Ravens become an outspoken advocate of the need for the conservation throughout the world based on the effort to attain sustainability and social justice elsewhere. He was described by Time magazine as a hero for the planet. I think every, uh, every one of us have to uh, try to persuade our colleagues, our people, and what we really know about this uh, global warming and climate change, as well as this how to uh, improve this uh, global sustainability. And the recommendation made by uh, Dr. Peter Ravens for Taiwan and how to uh, keep this uh, biodiversity as much as we can and also uh, to uh, in interact with other countries in the whole world and uh, try to uh, make this a uh, global uh, sustainability uh, can uh, be maintained. I think this is uh, really a good recommendation. And with regard to the seeds on uh, conservation basic in Taiwan, our uh, industrial food and, uh, uh, center, we do have uh, seed and uh, preservation centers in uh, Xinzhou. 
and agricultural. Agricultural. And, yeah. and um, with regard to the older, not wild, uh, not wild, then we may try to promote that. And I believe that in the future, uh, Dr. Ravens can uh, lead us and also work together with all our academia Seneca colleagues and try to make this biodiversity uh, um, story uh, made more successful. And of course, it needs uh, no more public education and also uh, need everybody's uh, collaboration. Uh, with that, uh, let us uh, thank uh, Dr. Ravens again for his uh, very inspiring and very uh, important talk uh, to all of us.